Hi, everyone. Can everyone hear me okay? Um, so, um, yeah, I'm here to talk to you guys about uh, Bad Conservation Trust and the work that we do in Bad Conservation in the UK. Uh, feel free to tweet, tag me and Bad Conservation Trust if you want as well. And, and in 20 minutes, I won't have the time to cover every single thing, but I hope to give you a nice overview. Oh, I forgot about that, sorry. That's important. Um, I hope to give you a nice overview of the work that we do. So how did Bad Conservation um, Trust started? Before Bad Conservation Trusts started, there were uh, local bat groups all over the UK. And you can see some uh, over there. I think those are the current figures. Uh, and they did the main uh, work in bat conservation. So they did, so they, so local bat groups are essentially uh, groups of volunteers. They do um, conservation work, engagement, training, etc. And in 1991, oh. Bat Conservation Trust uh, was funded. Um, and uh, at the moment, uh, so local bat groups did not stop to exist. They, stu they still do exist and they play a major role in bat conservation trust in the UK. So the Bat Conservation Trust is like the national organization and the umbrella organization for bat conservation in the UK. But local bat groups still do like frontline conservation work and they're essential in bat conservation in the UK. So if you go to our website, this is the work that we do, some of the areas that we cover. So we do a lot of groundwork uh, conservation and a lot of behind the scenes as well. And all of the work that we do falls within three main objectives and they are to discover, to act and to inspire. So we cannot uh, protect what we don't know. So we need to know more about bats and there is still so much we don't know about bats. So that's essential. We need to act on that evidence-based uh, information that we collect and we need to inspire others. All of the work that we do with bats, it doesn't matter at all if we don't inspire others to carry out the work that we have done and, we, and, and that we are doing. So communication, engagement and inspiring are key. Uh, so I'm just going to give you some examples of some of the projects uh, that we do that fall within these three areas. And starting with Discover, the National Bat Monitoring Program, which is a citizen science project uh, run by volunteers. And it's like the name says, to monitor bat populations. We have a range of surveys. Um, they're all over there on the bottom of the screen. Uh, and basically, uh, volunteers get involved. There is a survey for everyone. So if you have no experience in bat, bat monitoring at all, you can get involved, even if you don't know anything about bats. And there's obviously surveys for more experienced people. So uh, in the map on the right-hand side of the slide, there's a, a distribution of volunteers between 2015 and 2017. So like I said, all of the surveys are done by volunteers, only volunteers. They do amazing work and they put on the time and the effort and the dedication, which is really cool. We have uh, 18 species of bats in the UK and we are able to produce population trends for 11 out of those species. Uh, and you can see the numbers of and which species in each of the countries in the UK. <laughs> um, the data that these volunteers collect allows us to um, not only produce these population trends, but also to publish our results and our data. So uh, uh, last year, this year we've, um, we've published the state of the UK bats, uh, and um, we were able to see that three of our species were slightly uh, starting to increase, but that's from our baseline year of 1999, and all the other species out of the 11 that we are able to monitor today are stabilizing. <coughs> Whenever we talk to people and with the press, we always say, that obviously it's super positive that some of our species are increasing and none of them are declining, but we need to take this with caution because it is since the baseline of 1999 um, and it's after dramatic declines of populations as well. So although it is positive, we need to take it with caution and continue the work that we do. And we think that these positive results are a combination of legislation and the work that we do and the work that all of the volunteers do. Um, uh, and this is a new survey that we are working on. So basically, we cannot, we need to keep up, keep up with the technology, essentially. Um, uh, because, uh, so the Natural Bat Monitoring Program, NBMP, it was started 22 years ago. And since then, as you know, technology has advanced so much. So we are starting the world's first end-to-end -end <coughs> system for monitoring bats at a national scale. So I'm just going to run you through some of the points of how this is going to work. So it starts with a low-cost, full-spectrum back detector, which is an audio moth, which we are developing with the University of Southampton. Um, this will allow anyone to sort of just 
full spectrum back detectors are very expensive, so this is nice. It's sort of just like a skeleton, so it's quite um, easy to get-ish. And then the next step is an app where volunteers will send the audio recordings to a central server. And then we're also uh, developing uh, algorithms that will identify not only uh, if that sound is a bat, and if it is a bat, what species of bat it is. And obviously, we want this to be a two line of communication. We don't want volunteers to just send us all their data and that's it. We want this to be uh, engaging and interactive, so we are also um, uh, building a portal so that volunteers can sort of explore their data and their results. And we've piloted this last year and this year, and so far the feedback has been super positive, which is very encouraging. But obviously, launching a national scale project like this doesn't come without its challenges. The audio moth, we're still trying to figure out a case, um, sorry, we're still figuring out how to make a case that's waterproof and, that's an, and that doesn't affect these, the recordings. Um, audio files are absolutely huge, and if you think about uh, several audio moths all over the place recording all night around, that's hundreds, thousands of calls. So we need to think about data storage. We also need, need to think about funding, obviously. Um, so moving on to the next objective, which is ACT, which is uh, some, some of the work that we do also involves engaging with, government, with the government, and that's super important, and it seems to be even more important in the current political climate in the UK, so we try to keep that communication, that those lines of communication open. We try to engage government and decision makers as much as we can, try to win events. In the UK, I don't know if many of you know, there's a project called the Species Champion Project, where we try to involve members of parliament with um, NGOs, so each um, minister of parliament chooses a species they would like to engage with, and they're like not like the spokesperson and the, the voice for that species. And we have three species champions um, in, in England. Uh, we are also doing a lot of work um, with Brexit, but we don't have the sort of capacity to do it all, all ourselves. So we partner with other um, organizations. So we are part of the Wildlife and Countryside Link and Greener UK, and they are sort of, um, they are speaking up for bats and to make sure the legislation for bats is going to be um, as much as possible for bat populations in the UK. Um, another, so this is another collaborative project, which is the Bats in Churches project. It started last year. <laughs> bats really like to roost in churches. Um, I don't know if it's because of the architecture of churches, but uh, churches have the potential for really large roosts, which can cause quite a lot of uh, negative um, impacts on churches. So the project basically tries to minimize or, uh, or eliminate those negative problems that large roosts can cause to churches. Um, and I can tell you a bit more about that later. So I'm just going to move on. Another collaborative project is the Back from the Brink project. So this is a, collaborative, a collaboration between 20 organizations, 20 NGOs in the UK. And the goal, its very ambition, is to save from the extinction 19 species, and that's either animal or plant. We have a project on the grey long-eared bat. Uh, in the UK, um, the grey long-eared bat is only distributed in the southwest of England, and it's estimated that only 1,000 individuals are left. So we have that project going on. Then we have other collaborative projects, and they're more sort of habitat focused, but they estimate that all 19 projects will probably benefit 200 more species, and that's animals and plants. This is another collaborative project. You're gonna hear this word a lot during my talk. It's called the Partnership for, for the Biodiversity and Planning. It's essentially a tool that, that will allow any non-ecological consultants to see if their project will require an ecological consultant and will uh, determine if any sort of biodiversity will be affected by their project. So early in the stages of a project, so before you put in a planning application for your project, a non-ecological person like a planning authority or an individual will be able to go through this tool, and this tool is called the Wildlife Assessment Check. And uh, the tool, you run through the tool, and the tool will tell you, yes, I think your project is really going to affect biodiversity, 
is going to affect bats and badgers. So you will need to hire an ecological consultant. And at the moment, usually people will hire ecological consultants before the application, and it costs them a lot of money. And a lot of the times the results are, oh, no, it's fine, you're good. So this will sort of tell them before the application is put through. Um, this is a project funded by ESME Fairburn, and it has sort of two branches. So the Bearing Witness for Wildlife has a project called the Mitigation Project, uh, and the project assesses whether or not mitigation measures that have been put in place in previous projects, if they have been successful or not, why not, and sort of it will produce a report to see uh, what sort of mitigation uh, measures, and that's mainly back boxes, uh, what's working and what's not working, and, and what we can improve and what's not working. And the other side of the Bearing Witness for Wildlife project is the conservation wildlife crime. So we already had a bat crime officer where basically uh, he basically investigates any sort of bat crime um, offenses or any suspicions that a bat crime has been committed. He was working part time on this with the funding from ASME Fairburn. He is now working more and not just with bats, but other wildlife. He also produces lots of training for other NGOs as well. Um, so that's a project that's really kicking off now. We've produced, um, alongside with Wildlife and Countryside Link, the second wildlife crime uh, report. That's all available online. You guys can download it if you want. Uh, we have a few projects with woodland bats as well. We are very conscious that we don't have any population trends for woodland bat species in the UK. So Barbicells and Bexstines, for example. Uh, so it is the gap in our knowledge that we are trying to address. Uh, so a few projects on that, and you can ask me all about them as well. And then Inspire. This is quite a unique uh, aspect of the work that Bat Conservation Trust does. So we have a helpline. People call us if they find an injured bat, if they think uh, they're doing building works and they find a roost of bats and they don't know what to do. Sorry, uh, they know that bats are protected in the UK, so they're seeking for advice. Uh, they want to get involved in bat conservation, they don't know how. They think their neighbor has just killed an entire roost of bats. What can they do? So it can be lots and lots of um, uh, different queries. So we have a helpline to deal with these queries. Um, so, for example, I mentioned that people. Uh, sometimes find bats and need help and they call us. We are in touch with a network of volunteers and that's over 300 volunteers that take care of bats. They rehabilitate bats and they do all of this in their own time. The helpline runs Monday to Fridays between 9 and 4 p.m. During the summer we have, uh, I think in 2017 we had over 50,000, 15,000 queries and that's emails and calls. During the summer, which is the peak, uh, it's, even, uh, it's even worse, basically. So uh, sometimes during a week, you can have like 300 queries in one, in one week. So the phone is just ringing off the hook nonstop. Uh, so we, during the summer, we hire a few more people uh, to help us deal with the volume, volume of calls as well. Um, we are involved in just doing a lot of publications. We had a really cool collaboration with Mammal Next Door, producing a Bats and Trees poster uh, that has been translated to loads of languages, and we do other leaflets as well. Um, and uh, if anyone is interested in translating some of our posters, do come forward and come and speak to me as well. Um, this is the work that I'm most involved with, is some membership fundraising and engagement. We have over 6,000 members, and that's not just UK, that's all over the world, really. Um, we have um, even corporate members. People can even join for life and be members for life. Uh, we produce magazines, two magazines, three times a year for all of our members. We've just launched a new website, which is really, really cool, and I'm really proud of. Do join the Bat Conservation Trust if you haven't already. Um, and one of the challenges is to not only continue to engage with our current audiences, but seek different audiences as well and different people to engage with. You, you cannot just sort of, you know, uh, just uh, talk with like people that like bats and bat conservation. You need to sort of engage with as many people as you want, as you can. And fundraising 
uh, is a huge part of the work that we do as well. So if, for example, if you go to our website and if you go to our gifts page, we have a list of people in there that uh, make all sorts of bat mer merchandise and they donate part of their profits to bat conservation, which is really cool. Another project that I've been really uh, uh, interested and <laughs> really happy. This doesn't sound very important in the grand scheme of things, but it is, and I'm really proud of it. It's super engaging. Uh, it brings in the funds. And when I'm doing events and I'm talking to kids, I talk about it. I ask them, so what's the first thing you notice about this bat? And they notice the long ears. And I was like, so what do you think this bat is called? So it's super engaging. It starts the conversation. And really, it isn't just kids. Adults love these as well. And I'm really proud of these. So I just needed to mention this little bat. So the future, yeah, you can adopt one as well. It's on the website. <laughs> That's Echo. That's mine. Um, so uh, the future of back construction in the UK. I think someone should have, should have uh, counted how many times I've said the word collaborative project because that is key in any uh, conservation, not just bat conservation, but any conservation. It's collaborative projects, multidisciplinary projects as well. Um, and that's important and that's something that Bat Conservation Trust does a lot. Um, Obviously, there's challenges ahead, obvious challenges like legislation, what's going to happen with Brexit, and all of that uh, malarkey. Um, funding, it's always a challenge, and it's so important as well. We cannot do any of the work that we do without funding, without money, and that's very important. New technologies, like I've mentioned with the British Bat Survey, uh, we need to keep up with the technology so we can engage with different people as well, with the uh, bigger number of people. And new audiences as well, like I've also mentioned. Um, projects in the pipeline. So uh, we have quite a few. Uh, bat ringing. Uh, so one of the projects that one of my colleagues is trying to move forward is producing bat ringing guidelines and a centralized database for bat ringing, which doesn't uh, exist at the moment. Um, I didn't even mention stuff like bats and lighting and bats and diseases. We've actually just produced a bats and lighting guideline in the UK. I actually have a copy if anyone is interested, but it's all downloadable, downloadable um, for free in our website. Uh, Eurobats also published their own guidelines as well. I also have a copy if you guys want to have a look. Um, and bats and diseases, also super important, uh, especially with climate change. Is that going to affect how diseases spread uh, from Europe to the UK? Um, so yeah, lots of things we still don't know about bats. And that's very important because we cannot protect and we cannot you know, um, predict and plan for things that we don't know. I also should have mentioned that the State of the UK bats that I've mentioned before, I also have a few copies as well. So if you guys want to grab um, some of those, I have them. I cannot not thank all of the volunteers. I mean, volunteers are so important for the work that Bat Conservation Trust does. Uh, people that run surveys, uh, bat carers, all of the local bat groups, they are all volunteers. So Bat Conservation Trust is nothing without all, all of our volunteers. Uh, obviously, people that donate money and time uh, that fundraise for bats. Some people do crazy stuff like going up mountains and raising funds for bats. Like, <laughs> who does that? Quite a few, actually. You'd be surprised. And um, I think I talked really fast, so I think I'm... Um, under, uh, yeah, I think I'm done. Thanks. Any questions? <laughs>